Welcome to Inflection Point Conversations. I'm Michelle Obeda, an art director at Shimahara Visual. This series emerged as a reaction to the highly disruptive AI revolution that's reached an inflection point within our industry. We hope to take a deep dive into this revolution. Join us. Today, I'm speaking with Brian Kelly. Brian Kelly is a licensed architect in the US and associate professor of architecture at the University of Nebraska. He teaches studios at all levels of the curriculum, ranging from design thinking in the introductory core to design research studios in the master's program. Brian's research focus is broadly investigating the agency of authorship in the design process, specifically interrogating copyright and appropriation within software applications, including artificial intelligence. His work has garnered several awards and recognitions and has been published internationally. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. Appreciate, uh, appreciate the invite. Uh, can you talk a bit about your research on authorship in the design process? Sure. Um, I've been, uh, it's been a bit of a path. Uh, you know, it's been something I've been interested in for a while relative to both, um, you know, when the situation with teaching in a university anymore, uh, at least my experience, is that you're oftentimes in a situation where you're trying to um, capitalize on your own research, but also trying to bring that research into, you know, into classes, into studio environments. So it's been something that I've been investigating on my own, but also investigating with students for uh, quite some time now. And I've, I've uh, you know, started with uh, thinking on um, helping to author our design thinking course, which happened at the beginning. It's our, our core course, one of our core courses that we offer at the, at the College of Architecture. Um, so team-based collaboration and just got me starting to think about like, how do we, how do we offer things and how do we have, um, you know, degree of, um, I would say ownership within the design process. Uh, I then transitioned this into looking at more open source architecture, open source design, and looking at ways in which uh, content is shared amongst teams, amongst um, digital platforms, et cetera. Uh, and then uh, did a, uh, what I call studio copyright, and there's purposely a copy or space between copy and write, uh, implying the idea of how to copy correctly, um, and did a lot of research into the history of the copy itself, um, how it's been used through design process, um, architectural design, and even, you know, creative, all creative works through, throughout a, well, a long period of history, actually. Um, you know, it's, it's actually the way the architects used to be trained is by looking at copying um, treatises and ornamental details and things like that as kind of the way that you learn how to do things is by copying it. So I brought that idea into, into a design studio where, um, you know, we really were taking a mindset almost of a, um, you know, very similar to the way that, like, I would say that the Beastie Boys work with with hip hop and the ideas of how um, sampling and mixing and really bringing a lot of different disparate sources together to then bring a whole new thing out of that. Um, the, the research question, I guess, I asked with these students was how, you know, how might we use all these kind of different sources that are, you know, that we don't own, um, that we are appropriating from other places. And we've been doing that for years, like I said, with precedents and things like that, but maybe being a little bit more overt with it mm -hmm. and trying to look at how that can be something that even, you know, my theory about it was that once students started to use this stuff and mix it in rather sophisticated ways, that inevitably it would become their own. It would not become, mm -hmm. um, you know, just a sort of gluing together of um, parts It actually, by the appropriation of it, it had to actually have a new identity to it. Um, yeah, which then eventually evolved into me looking into, uh, you know, aggressive forms of collage, digital collage, which then obviously, you know, learned, um, into, uh, or moved into artificial intelligence and which I think is at some levels, a, a pretty sophisticated method of, of digital collage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting that you've researched sort of copying in history. Do you feel like this is like a deliberate version of that? Um, I've compared right now where we're at with artificial intelligence to me, uh, this is going to date me a little bit, but, uh, it, I think it's very similar to me in, in a similar, uh, vein as what we were with the late nineties, early two thousands with Napster. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a lot of things happening that were probably not quite ethical relative to appropriation of content, maybe misappropriation, not giving proper credit to people, et cetera. Um, and so copyright law had to catch up and, uh, you know, it, you know, they 
things came out of that, like Spotify and Pandora and things like that. Uh, you know, I, I would say that probably music artists would say that it wasn't necessarily done in a way that gives them the the monetary gain, I think, is what I heard that that they think they should get out of it. But I think we're in the similar, situa similar situation with AI right now. Copyright is copyright law specifically is uh, it seems like always in a in a mode of catching up. Um, you know, there's a there's a phrase in copyright law that talks about any future, you know, covers mediums that are there right now, but it also tries to cover any future mediums. And it says that like any anything that basically saying like, you know, we don't know what's coming next, but mm -hmm. anything that's similar to this, we want to make sure to try to cover that as well. But it doesn't do a great job of doing that. And so, you know, and we're a common law, um, you know, country in the U.S. where we have uh, basically law precedent that makes makes new laws. And so, um, you know, the the uh, court cases right now that are going through it are probably the way that it's going to start to shake out, you know, relative to future ideas of uh, content ownership and things like that. So it's, yeah, I think it's a it's a version of copying. It's a version of, of uh, collage, but um, it's it's nuanced. You know, it's 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 a it's a bit of a tricky ground right now. That's for sure. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about that too. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the the uh, sort of research studies that your students are doing, and in particular how AI is part of that process? Yeah, so with the like I said, with the Studio Copyright, we were working with just uh, an old school collage, uh, old school digital collage. I actually wasn't allowing them to use any three D software because uh, I wanted them to work with um, the image itself, and so that has kind of transitioned into uh, the studio now using. Um, Various ways of trying to use, for instance, mid-journey, stable diffusion, et cetera, for um, concept development and, um, you know, really starting to basically create a, a way of, you know, I found with me that the uh, the divergent ideation for this is really, ex it, for me, it's just expanded exponentially. And so I've used it as a way, like right now I'm doing a fourth year studio um, and it's teams of four students, four, four teams of four students, so 16 total students in the studio. And... Um, I, I phrase it to them that they, you know, the AI becomes a fifth team member. They have to really kind of negotiate with that, that extra team member because AI is going to throw ideas in it. AI throws probably more bad ideas than it does good ideas. And so there has to be the, uh, the sort of curatorial eye of the, of the architect in that situation to then understand, um, you know, what works and what doesn't work. And so, They've used it for for beginning stages, but even this, you know, just this uh, yesterday when I was talking to a group of students, they're, you know, they're in a in a design development phase, but they're going back to smaller components of it to sort of um, reinvestigate those to see what the potential of that specific like a detail or material investigation might start to yield relative to that. So we kind of use it in various touch points. I don't have a, you know, sort of dogmatic process that I take them through. I think it's much more, um, you know, it's specific to each team and where they're at in the process, what they're trying to do. Yeah. Do you think it's important, the idea of being conscious, let's say um, in the near future, lots of designers will be using artificial intelligence to come up with, you know, um, like different ways of being influenced and being deliberate with, with who, let's say you want to do as a style of a specific architect that, you know, using that as something that's positive and, and an influence, um, that getting your students to sort of think about that consciously is that is that the idea of of this sort of study yeah or just trying to find ways to get them to um you know as an example if they're looking at a way of trying to create a certain atmospheric condition for an entry into a building uh, just as a sort of quick random example they might be able to describe that um but they may not know exactly what that looks like yet um you know short of trying some different things or looking at precedents or whatever. And so they're using that as a way to, you know, kind of sharpen even their their vocabulary and their ways of describing space, but yeah. also ways that then, um, you know, like, as I'm sure you know, AI just spits it out pretty quickly. And so if they can describe it um, and they can sort of find nuance within the vocabulary that they're using to describe that, it starts to give them a lot of different ideas. So I, I actually don't encourage them to use, you know, in the style of Frank Gehry or in the style of, you know, whoever. Um, because I think it's it's used so much and it's um, it's quite ubiquitous now. And I think um, when I see that stuff, especially on social media or something like that, I just I sort mm. of tune out because it's just not, you know, for me, it's not interesting. Um, I know that mm. it does it rather well, 
But um, just because it does it well doesn't necessarily mean that it's what we should be doing with it. Yep. And so, how do you how do you encourage people to um, to curate and also to take things further? Like, how do you encourage how do you discourage the homogenization? Like you're just like you're talking about. Yeah. So I think in the beginning, you know, we're still without any kind of assistance of of um, you know just basically the design process itself is is giving us the way of understanding. Um, what I oftentimes refer to as the could versus the should. You know, there's a lot of things you could do, but what should you do with the project? And so mm -hmm. I have them start to define what they're just, you know, like any process that you would have in a design studio, starting to understand what the intentionality of the project is. Uh, and then that becomes the the sort of litmus test relative to them understanding if it works for what they're trying to do. Uh, and then they they start to then, you know, basically um, weigh that against whether or not it, it works. And if it's something that, uh, you know, becomes... Um, maybe too expected or too um, just normative or maybe as, you know, relative to style, maybe just too identifiable relative to, um, you know, it's, it's easily placed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and you have a professional architecture practice as well, don't you? Yeah, my wife and I are both architects. So we, um, you know, do projects on the side here and there. Um, it's not it's not a continuous flow of projects. It's, uh, you know, pretty specific about the kind of work that we do. Mm -hmm. Have you have you been able to introduce AI tools in your professional practice at all? Yeah, in in various places. Um, so one of the things we had just recently built was a, um, a it's just a privacy screen. So it's a very small project, kind of a micro patio, urban patio. Um, it was for some medical professionals. They were both in the medical field. Um, they were they had a place here in in Omaha that they were looking at trying to um, have a degree of privacy to this patio, but also they wanted to be able to see out of it, but they didn't want people to be able to see in it quite so well. And so uh, we looked at uh, trying to um, determine, so I, I've one of my longer research interests is medical imagery and mm -hmm. the sort of history of that relative to the ways that architects draw. We've we've stolen a lot of techniques from, from the medical field uh, as an example of the, the section cut, cross section cut. Um, okay. And so I've been med interested in medical imagery for a while. And so we use this idea of um, DNA sequencing and DNA, um, you know, the sort of the readout that you get, the visual readout, and then using that as a pattern. Uh, so I had AI generate, um, you know, just a series of DNA DNA patterns, but that was kind of weird as well, that it's, you know, it's a it's a bot, it's an artificial intelligence, but I'm asking it to create something that reflects, um, you know, sort of natural life. Um, mm. But it came up with a, just a variety, you know, because again, it comes up with so many different options. And so it came up with a whole different list of or, or, you know, grouping of, of images, um, I then selected ones that had a, a good diversity to them. Um, we then took it into a fairly, you know, old process of, of using um, parametrics, grasshopper, to, to determine a perforation pattern. Uh, we randomized that pattern and we used it across um, a series of steel panels that were cut out then. Um, and then those, those panels are, um, you know, naturally rusting panels, rusting steel. And so it's this kind of, and I can send you an image of it, but there's, um, you know, these... Uh, after it's been in place now for uh, about nine months, it's now um, got a very nice patina on it. And so from the inside, mm -hmm. you can see people walking by and it's just a series of perforations. But from the outside, it's kind of an abstracted pattern of, you know, nobody walking by is going to say, hey, that looks like a DNA pattern. Uh, but mm -hmm. it became the way that we started to integrate these things. And I was just interested in, it was um, at the very beginning of a mid journey. Um, the images are quite uh, rough because, uh, you know, it was like version two, I think, version three that I was using for it. And uh, it was just, you know, it wasn't creating the best imagery, but it was good enough for what I was using it for relative developing uh, perforation patterns. But just wanted to try to see, like, if we, you know, can this be part of, again, another team member, but it can be, can it be part of our process and be something that, I mean, I could probably, you know, borrow some DNA patterns or produce something, you know, sort of a, a, a fabricated way. But uh, I, I thought, well, this can do it really quickly and also create a good diversity to them. Um, and it's just a visual thing that AI can probably replicate quite easily. And so um, it became a great way to, or a great place in the design process to interject that into. Yeah. So I have been following your Instagram account with the different sort of mid-journey images, uh, facades and iterations that you've been putting up and enjoying the the variations. I think that something that stood out to me was that you'd put a post up, you'd put an image up and then a bunch of different variations, which I imagine you had to curate, let's say six out of out of many. Can you talk to me a little bit about that process and, and why you got into into that? 
Um, so the process of doing it, yeah, you're you're correct that it's um, you know for for maybe ten in tip images that are put up, there's you know maybe a hundred that are generated. Um, I think my I, I just checked the other day, and I think I have twenty eight thousand uh, images that have been generated, which is um, uh, somewhat embarrassing. But at the same time, uh, you know, just uh, it's, there's a commitment to to working on that and trying to mm. um, figure out how to work within the tool, but but yeah, I, I, I essentially, um, I pull images that I feel like are interesting to me and that I feel like are trying to capture some of the things that I'm interested in relative to, to AI generation. And, um, again, I, you can see there's, there's accounts out there that there's, there's thousands of accounts out there that I think are, are producing work. And I think that they're, they're trying to look at how to produce the most exquisitely rendered and realistic looking building. Uh, for me, that's not, that's not as interesting. Uh, I'm interested more in which I think as you know, we can, we can get into this if you're, if you're interested that there's, um, as mid journey, as an example, keeps going, it has less error to it. And so there's mm -hmm. less kind of glitchiness or weirdness to it. And so for me, that's where the, the, you probably saw the odd facade series that I've been working on for a while mm -hmm. that really started because, you know, it was, you know, I would generate a facade as an example, and it would put, you know, as, as an example, windows in a weird place in a place that I would, as a professional, I'd be like, there's no, like, why would you do that? That doesn't make any sense. Or it would put, you know, material configurations in places that it just didn't make sense. But then my, like I said, my immediate reaction was, why? That's, that's, that's a ridiculous place to put that window. But then as I started looking at it, it's like, wait a second, there's something there that's pretty interesting. Um, and you know, again, relative to teaching, um, the naivety of a of a beginning design student, you know, first maybe a year or two, I think is a huge asset um, that they they don't know what they don't know, and they just do things. And for me, okay. it's 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 invigorating. Uh, I I really think it's pretty awesome to see. But I think AI, in its earlier versions, was doing that as well. It just you know, like why not put a window there? Um, and so right. it just it would just throw it there. And I I found that to be like super fascinating. Um, then it would, it would just configure buildings in ways that I, I would probably not have done myself just because I know that like, wait a second, you can't do it that way. But then as I look at it, I'm like, wait a second, you actually maybe can do it that way. And there might be mm -hmm. some interesting ways that, you know, creates a different kind of view or a different kind of relationship of interior to exterior or something like that. It just depends on the situation you're looking at. Um, but that error to me was something that, uh, I was just really fascinated with. Um, and it was something where, it basically became, a, you know, sort of a handshake or an ushering in of me to then fill the gap um, as a sort of, you know, as a person that's trained architect, licensed architect to say like, okay, wait, that doesn't make any sense, but let's see what that actually could become um, as a sort of new interpretation of it. So I, you know, I just got started on that. And like I said, it's, it's gotten to the point where, you know, AI doesn't like error. It doesn't want to do things incorrectly. It's, its goal is to be the most efficient and the smartest, um, you know, sort of application of doing whatever it's trying to do. Um, and so it tries to identify error and eradicate it. And, um, and it's, it's continuing as we keep evolving, it's continuing to do that. Um, which for me, I'm, I'm having to work a little bit harder to get it to do things, uh, that maybe don't make as much sense or that I find, um, you know, pretty interesting. And with some of these, it may be, you know, I, even with, I'm, when I'm working with students, I tell them that sometimes, you know, it's maybe like, out of the full image, it might be 15, 20% of the image that you find compelling. It's never going to be a hundred. Well, it shouldn't be a hundred percent of the image. Um, it should be just a smaller portion that you find like, wait a second, there's something there that I could really take and move forward. Because again, these are basically like, um, you know, the introduction to the book that we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, it's the, the person that we interviewed for that was, was describing it this way. And it's the same way that I feel about it, which is that there's you know, these are like sketches. They're nothing really different than a hand sketch used to be. Um, they're just done quicker and they're done sort of outside. I, I think people would argue that, I guarantee people would argue that it's that it's not the same as old, uh, old style sketch. But the way that it engages the design process, I think is very similar. It's meant as something that's okay. a 2D image. There's a lot of resolution. There's a lot of, you know, if you, anybody that's gone through a process of developing a project and having it built knows that this image is nothing more than just a speculation and yeah. uh, a possibility of what could be um, but it, you know, if it's going to be a realized building that's occupied at some point in time, it's going to have to go through a, an incredibly long process that is not unlike 
some of the other processes, at least at this point, it's not unlike other processes that are happening that yeah. likely to change, but. So do you feel like using the AI tools is actually expanding the possibilities of the starting point for the design, like the questions that you want to ask in design? Like for, me, for example. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I think for me, it's expanding the ways in which I think about um, the problem at hand, but also for me, it's also expanded uh, the identification of problems that I didn't think of before. So it might mm -hmm. actually in some ways create projects or create opportunities for new projects that maybe weren't there before because, you know, it brings up, you know, certain images or connections or details or whatever it may be that you're like, hmm, that, that, that as a microcosm could be a pretty interesting project. And so you take that and sort of like run with it. Yeah, I really enjoyed your series. I'm enjoying your series. I hope you're doing more of the the poor circulation where you have yeah. staircases that don't quite make design sense because yeah. I feel like they make you question they make you question the whole idea of of circulation. For example, just taking the circulation. Um, yeah, I guess yeah, that kind of ideas, illustrates. Uh, I'm trying to. I mean, I'm I love satire, and um, I'm trying to think about. You know, maybe not being so serious about it. There's uh, there's an old episode of The Simpsons. There's an escalator to nowhere. I think it's called, and you know, it's this old time <laughs> joke about that it goes up and it doesn't really go anywhere. Um, I, I think the poor circulation series is very similar, and that's the same thing. It's it's really integrating this idea of error. It doesn't know. It's trying to understand, in that case, something that's very performative, meaning it has to perform in a certain way with you know rise, run, egress, you know, width of it. There, it's it's oftentimes the the shape and size and configuration of a stair is. is is determined by code. Mm -hmm. uh, AI doesn't understand that because it's working with an image or an understanding of a series of images to then generate a new stair, which means that it might, you know, kind of traipse down in a normal way and then it starts to, you know, it'll swipe underneath or something and it just, you know, doesn't do it correctly. And so the first time those came out, um, you know, the first sort of series of the poor circulation, I was, again, it was one of those things where I was like, wait, wait a second, that is bizarre. But you know, then this idea of there's even people that on Instagram that said that they, you know, there was one of them was sitting in the middle of a gallery space, it looked like, and they're like, I'd love to see this thing built um, as a, as a, you know, sort of speculative thing, but even as a, as a art, art uh, object within a gallery or something like that. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that there is some, some relevance to them. And I think that, you know, the, again, the intent for me is not to say like, let's go build this stair, but to try to, um, you know, maybe engage some conversations or dialogue around it. Yeah. What software do you use? Have the different AI software? I've been using, tools? Um, I've been messing around a little bit. Mostly I would say it's mid journey. Um, I've been messing around with stable diffusion and, and control net as well. Um, and then just a few others that I've just, I, I haven't, wouldn't say that I really delved much into them. I'm just trying to see what they do relative to other, other applications. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not writing any, any, uh, you know, I'm not training any models. I'm not writing any software for this. Uh, I'm I'm on the side of a of a user, but uh, um, you know, I think it's something where for me, I'm not. I, I don't feel like it, I I don't feel like I need to write software to be able to do this. I don't feel like it's something that would take my investigations to another place. I feel like it's doing for me. Um, it's allowing me to investigate what I want to what I want to look into without necessarily having to engage that side of it. Yeah. How would you like to see AI being used in architecture in, in the near future? Well, obviously with, uh, you know, I'm training future architects. Uh, I'm an architect myself. Uh, I'm, you know, definitely interested in, in maintaining the ideas of what labor can do and the ability for people to, you know, be, I mean, every, I think every parent that sends their kid to college hopes that they're going to graduate and be able to, find a job and, and, uh, you know, be gainfully employed, et cetera. Um, so I think that there's, you know, I, I think that the ability for the architect to continue to be an important part of the, of the design process, um, but ways that maybe it can start to automate some things that are just, um, you know, that don't involve a lot of thought to them, um, or ways to, um, you know, sort of double check or, or create ways of, quality control or um, things like that, where we start to use it as a way to basically analyze our work um, to see mm -hmm. if, you know, for instance, there's, there's people out there that are developing AI apps that are able to look at your building and determine if it's, if there's uh, code violations or uh, there's ways that it can, um, 
you know, sort of populate furniture and then even go to the extent of buying the furniture. And so it, you know, starts to, to, um, maybe move into the realm of a little bit of interior design there. But, um, but I think it's starting to, to, again, it's a bit of a rogue territory because people are just, it's the natural way we do things. We want to say like, well, it can do this. I wonder if it can do that. And then we just keep mm -hmm. going. And, uh, you, you don't really know when you've gone too far until, until you hit that point. Um, but I think at the point when it starts to to um, you know put people out of work, I think it becomes problematic. But the way that it starts to maybe make things more efficient and and make a better built environment um, through quality control and things like that, I think that's that's certainly welcome on my part. Yeah, yeah. I think the thing uh, that draws a lot of people is the efficiency, right? So like being able to sort of take away a lot of the manual labor and that that frees you up to do more like creative work, for example. Yeah, I think that there's people that are, you know, with when it comes to even mid journey and stuff like that, you'll find that there's, or I've, you know, been doing it for a little over a year now, um, about a year and a half, I would say, and there are people that have, you know, a lot of people that start on it and they get bored with it really quick because they're just not quite sure what they're trying to do or what it, you know, because it's so quick and it can give you a quick response. Um, you get to a point where you're like, mm, I don't really know what to do, and I've actually a few times. Got to a point where I I said, hmm, you know, maybe I'm maybe I'm running out of things to look at. But then, you know, there's so many other ways to work with it. So like even reverse engineering things. So I'll sometimes you know take some of the images that I've generated, I'll drop them into Mid Journey and use the describe command, and then it'll actually kick a prompt out for it. It'll allow me to then, in the same way that if I read an article, I look at the work cited, the bibliography at the end of it to see where they're pulling their information from. And so when I look at the prompt generation that Mid Journey develops out of some of my images. It'll bring up sources, you know, it'll do kind of in the style of, or it'll say other other references or other different types of, uh, you know, work that it, that it thinks it looks like. Um, and then I'll look those up, just Google them and see what, you know, I, maybe I haven't heard of this person's work. And so I'll look them up uh, just to try to understand maybe what their work is about and how they're coming at it. So those kind of, I guess, ways of looking at it has allowed me to, to maintain, um, you know, a clear, I, I think a clear trajectory relative to the ways that I'm trying to investigate with it. But there are a lot of people, I think that they just, you know, because like you said, the efficiency, they just get bored with it and because it's so mm -hmm. quick, they just sort of like run out of things to do with it. But um, I guess I'm just a, I like to tinker with things. So I keep, you know, I keep trying to figure out what I can do with it and what else, what else it can do. Yeah. It's really interesting because it seems to feed back into your idea of, you know, studying where style and influence comes from and then studying where, like the AI tool, like Mid Journey, takes your prompts from or generates prompts from. Maybe there's like loops and loops and cycles in your brain and in the tool that is like bringing influences back in. So like you can actually investigate that with the tool. Yeah, I had a professor in college that um, when I first had him, it seemed like most of my desk crits were, "Hey, you should look at," you know, he'd look at my, you know, the drawings or models or whatever that I had. Um, he'd say, yeah, this kind of reminds me of this project. You should look at that. And then he'd say like, well, this, you know, this kind of reminds me of the work of this architect and about, uh, you know, embarrassingly, I didn't do it as soon as I should have, but maybe about halfway through the semester, I started just writing these down and right. looking them up and going to, well, in that case, the library, um, you know, going to the library to just look at books and figure out, um, it became a challenge for me to say like, okay, what did he see in this, in this drawing or in this model or whatever that looks mm -hmm. like this project or that there's some similarities to it. And that has become something that for me with even, you know, like with uh, desk crits with my students on a, on a daily basis, I am continually throwing references at them, partly because I want them to be aware of, you know, practice is, it's like the practice of law, practice of medicine. It's a continual process of figuring it out. Because um, every time you're given a new building, a new site, a new whatever, a new program, uh, a new budget, all these things, it's different. So it's never the same situation time after time. And so you have to develop a mindset of um, being just interested in, in investigating it. And so okay. with me, I, you know, I, I remember being on, in, again, in college and having a, you know, fi maybe a final review at the end of the semester and somebody would say like, you know, this really looks like this project. And then I go look at that project and it looks very similar. I'm like, man, I thought I was figuring something out here and it's already been done, you know? So it was like yeah. kind of frustrating at some levels, but that just encouraged me to be, more aware of the precedents and more aware of the lineage that uh, the work comes from um, and to try to figure out how that becomes, um, you know, sort of an aggregate that then 
maybe produces new work that, um, you know, that maybe, uh, I mean, I'm certainly not interested in just copying and replicating work that's been done before, but I'm, I'm definitely interested in understanding where things come from and being able to then author new work that is informed by that and maybe pushes it further. Yeah. Do you feel like it's really important to know who you're influenced by or what stars you're influenced by in order to be creative, making something new? I think absolutely. And I think also not only understanding the ones that are, that are the obvious, you know, if you're working on a museum, understanding people that have done museums before, but um, digging a little bit deeper into the, the sort of second and third layer of that and understanding, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a circulation strategy and you're trying to understand that or it's a siting strategy or it's a material strategy that maybe comes from a place that isn't a museum. Um, you know, the students right now that are in my studio are working on a, uh, a museum um, and a um, it's got an education, a museum, um, and also some sort of research components for the university. And you know they're they're looking at everything from vernacular architecture to defense architecture to um, museums to you know education buildings. They're kind of looking at really everything, uh, and then even mixing that in with with um, the voice coming from AI. And so they're having to negotiate really a lot of different you know sort of. Uh, um, influxes into the design. But for me, I think that, you know, it doesn't get any easier, especially when you start to do a building because buildings are super complex. And so um, the ability to start to figure out what needs to stay there and what needs to go, I think, um, to craft that. And then, you know, the, like you said, the style and things like that, they just become part of that. How do you negotiate, you know, what style the building's going to be? What um, what does it reference? What does it not reference? Because sometimes you know, as much as you may want to reference something, you also, there's other things that maybe you shouldn't reference that are, that are maybe okay. inappropriate relative to, you know, maybe cultural things or historical things or whatever it may be. So, yeah, yeah. so the, the, the awareness of that, that full spectrum is, I, I feel like it's super important. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. It's really interesting to, to bring that question and to make people aware of it, especially since you're teaching. Yeah, well, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to talk to you about the book that you have coming out soon, Art Artificial Intelligent Architecture. Can you tell us a little bit about this book? Yeah, it actually, uh, you know, you mentioned the Instagram before, and um, it's been a uh, it's been a great tool relative to connecting with people. Um, and so the co-editor on the on the book, uh, Frank Jacobus, who's the director at Penn State Architecture. Um, he reached out to me and I said, he saw some of the work I was doing and, and uh, we'd known each other before, but he said, Hey, would you be interested in, in, uh, co-editing a book on, on AI? And I was like, I didn't, really don't know what, what that entails yet. Cause like I said, it was my first book. Um, but certainly interested. And so we started talking and, um, we got a publisher on board ORO, um, and they were, uh, you know, they were interested in, in the work, but also they said, you know, that because it's moving so fast that we're going to have to accelerate the publication process. And so, you know, I've right. got colleagues at at, uh, at the university that, you know, sometimes two, three years to get a book done. Um, Frank and I, with the authors that are, there's 18 other authors in the book. Um, we finished the book, the text, editing, and all that stuff in about two and a half, three months. Wow. Um, super, super fast. Um, very yep. rigorous process. We're uh, very thankful to the the contributors that they were they were on board with that um you know we we knew that it was going to be a very fast process but we also like i said knew that it needed to get out uh we are also very aware that by the time that it does you know for instance hit the book uh the bookstores or, or amazon or wherever it's you know people get it from that it's likely out of date um and it's because it's moving so fast um you know print media just can't keep up with with oh. digital media um but the way we pitched it to Oro is that they're we're we're wanting this to be a book that's kind of marking a point in time um, to where it, it's a it's more like you know for instance uh, you know people would be recording um, voices of um, or interviewing people that went through you know like war or something like that because maybe they're dying off or something like that and they want to try to capture those sort of things and I don't want to really necessarily relate it to that but just the idea that we wanted to try to capture a voice at a point in time. Um, mm -hmm. with what it means to people and how they're understanding issues around AI. We had, we had shorter text pieces because we used it as a, um, each chapter is a, uh, a theory and praxis, um, um, diptych. And so we have people 
showing uh, you know 10, maybe 12 images, and then also then writing about the images as far as what it means and the, the sort of investigations they're going through. Um, you know, the chapter that I wrote was on, you know, obviously about copyright and um, content ownership and things like that. Um, you know, we have people that are writing about a variety of different things from prompt craft to, um, you know, ways that, for instance, it understands drawings to, it's just, you know, it's a quite a different um, spectrum of, of different types of work. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's something where, um, you know, we were, you know, like I said, just, I think once we realized and we were comfortable with the fact that it was going to be out of, I don't want to say out of date because I think when you read it, it's actually still quite relevant. Um, yeah. But it's just that, you know, some of the images and things like that and the ways that maybe we talk about it, if you're, if you're in that space, you know that there's things that are different now than they were, um, you know, six months ago. So, um, so I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's been a, it's been a great, uh, I guess, uh, you know, thing for me to do for a project. Um, to be able to just relate to other people and be able to understand how they're approaching it. We've got people from uh, Australia, UK, uh, France, um, uh, Middle East, um, of course, US. Um, and so there's, you know, there's quite a wide spectrum of people that are that are in it relative to which we really wanted to try to do as well to, to increase the voice. Um, and, you know, this is obviously something that's happening worldwide. And so uh, we wanted to try to, as much as possible, reflect that. And um, so I think it's it's also um, interesting in that regard as well. But Yeah, I can't wait to read it. It sounds really interesting. I feel like, you know, according to the images also that I've seen, I think it's going to be interesting to to read and learn a little bit about the processes and stuff like that. Yeah, it's been, it was a, it was a, it was fun for me to read. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Brian, for coming on. It's been it's been great talking to you. I feel You're like welcome. I've learned a lot and you've opened up a lot of questions for me about, I guess, about style and influence in particular. Like I didn't really, I never thought about interrogating it as much as you do. And I think I think that's awesome. Yeah, I appreciate the invite. And the, um, each time uh, you have a chance to talk about it, you kind of can keep figuring it out as well. And so I, I appreciate the, you know, I could just sit here and keep working on it. But uh, these these moments of, of discourse with other people, I think are really fantastic. So I appreciate the invite and the time that you've, that you've given to it. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been great talking to you, Brian. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.